50 years ago when Star Trek changed it all on Trekland Tuesdays Live, number 243, with me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you right here from the heart of Trekland through Portal 47 for the big picture and clarity and sanity in all things Star Trek. For reals, here we are, 50 years ago when Star Trek changed us all. Hey, all the uh, TTLers are here, going to be popping in. But if you're new to us, uh, welcome. Thanks for dropping by, finding yourself, stumbling in, however you got here. I've got a little admission to make here and some uh, I'm, I, Star Trek never ceases to amaze me. First of all, I hope our picture is better than last week. Not my fault. Finds out there's software switches. <laughs> I want to talk about something that, you know what? I didn't know. I didn't realize what this week's topic would be 50 years ago when Star Trek changed us all. I was thinking there's been a lot of Star Trek news. And by now, when Trek news breaks on Wednesday and Thursday, even Tuesday afternoons, by the time we roll around to another Tuesday, everybody and their dog have talked about it. And yeah, this is a huge week. We had the calendar, but not just that, the first Picard trailer. It's all pretty exciting. And we may talk about that when we get to chat. But I was as usual, trying to think of something that um, was off the radar, maybe connect some fresh dots to you. And I was really stumped this week. I was really about to break down and talk about actual news. And then it hit me. Actually, I think somebody, somebody on Twitter poked me on this and I was shocked. A, that it wasn't on my radar, but, but I don't think it's been on anyone's radar and I can't believe it. If you check your own calendar and look back exactly 50 years, maybe you've got a hint what I'm talking about. Anybody? Anybody? I'll see you the first one to claim it. No, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, January 21st to the 23rd, 1972, was the storied and ballyhooed very first Star Trek convention. For reals. And I know some of you are going to say, but what about the one at the library in Newark across the river in March of 69? That's true. There was a free event at a Newark public library that was, it was free. There were no guests. It was totally fan made. It drew about 300 people. The record tells us there's a cover for the program out there, which presumably is a cover. So yes. And there were skits. There were, there was a discussion on the Star Trek phenomena in March 69 about the time of the actual cancellation just before. Turnabout Intruder was delayed and aired in June, I know. And some slideshows, so early fair. But the first real convention that was started was in January 1972, this past weekend, exactly the, the calendar that we're on. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just like our Sunday was the 23rd. Organized by the original The Committee. And yeah, here is a flyer, Star Trek Lives. Look at that. A Star Trek convention at the Statler Hilton, which was the Hotel Pennsylvania, which I finally got to go visit. Uh, Star Trek Con, P.O. Box 95, Old Chelsea Station, New York, New York. Look at this here. Late Flash. This was a hand stamp on the flyer. Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry will be there Saturday afternoon. Now, what's great about that first one is there were no actors. There were people New York based. The idea was just come and talk about Star Trek, even though it had been three years since the cancellation, nearly three years. It was already into the rerun phenomena, building up from the grassroots. If ever there was a, a grassroots movement, it was Star Trek because these local stations were making money, realizing from the Sinclair stations uh, example that they could make tons of money with Star Trek after school, early evening at dinner time. Way better targeting than NBC had ever put it on in first run. And we can talk about the history of the first convention. But what I want to just say right off is, did anyone see anything about this? I, I, I'm I, just shocked that no one, a 50th? A 50th? <laughs> now, we've had people on the Trek Files. I've interviewed folks who were there. But no, I wasn't. I was a kid. I was stuck in the middle of the Great Plains the Southwest, I was about to be able to get out of, get myself to Oklahoma to New York, much less even hear about it. In fact, truth be told, I wasn't a Trek fan at the time. Um, <laughs> it was going to take my ninth grade teachers, not my eighth grade teachers. But that's the first on block. If you heard about the 50th anniversary of Star Trek Lives, the first Star Trek con, as it's been dubbed, uh, let me know. 
Let me know if you saw anybody podcast on it, write an article. There was nothing on StarTrek.com. I don't think there was anything on the big news sites. Heaven forbid if I'm the first one to kind of mention it out loud in public. But what's amazing, a fact on the side, it's just a trivia question, is I go back to this all the time. And this didn't dawn on me until the last five, 10 years, until the pundit years here, the last 10 years. Realize that at the same time that Comic-Con culture is so huge, and until the 50th anniversary of Trek in 2016, Trek was a tiny sliver of that because Marvel and, and DC and Star Wars and go down the line, Harry, uh, Harry Potter and, and Doctor Who had all taken over the slice of various comic cons, of course, led by the people in capes. Star Trek was such a small sliver of that. But if you unwind the saga, we've talked about this on the Trek files, the state of science fiction and fandom up until Star Trek came along was why Star Trek was such a breakout hit anyway. Filmed science fiction with the rare occasions of a big budget movie like Day the Earth Stood Still or Forbidden Planet or rarely on TV like Twilight Zone, the best of the outer limits maybe. You know, it was it was bug-eyed monster. It was screaming girl meets alien monster, a guy rescues, uh invader army invaders um, I mean, alien invaders or the radiation monsters get big and it's the, you know, it's the fifties crazy monster movies. And it was just thoughtless screaming Mimi stuff. Nothing thoughtful, actual science fiction fans who read literature because that's where the heart of science fiction was, were totally disdainful. It was like, oh yeah, on screen, big or small, prove it to me. I mean, that was the joke. It was the eye roll. But the, the fact was that, that even that population was so tiny. It was so tiny in the mainstream of things that no one cared anyway. <laughs> the way to make bucks if you wanted to do a sci-fi movie was to, you know, screaming leading lady and bugify it and bug-eyed monsters the thing up. Plus, special effects were not in their envy, we'd have to say. And you really had to spend a lot of money to do real mats, real visual effects for the time, right? No Bucks, no Buck Rogers, and even Buck Rogers looks pretty thin. So, yeah, that's part of the Star Trek revolution, and that bled over to fandom to the point that when Star Trek blew up in popularity in 67, in 68, in 69, and the Trekkies descended on sci-fi world, Worldcon, and also the regular regional conventions that were going on then in much fewer numbers than they are today, where, you know, 500 would be a great turnout. And yeah, on the 60 scale of things, maybe so, but still remember that 500, a few hundred people would be your typical, even the world cons would maybe get a thousand if they were American. And the reaction after a year or two of the Trekkie invasion, talk about gatekeeping. I used to just call it lit snobbery, but you know, it's like, well, this is all well and good and welcome to our con, but you really need to read your found. You know, there's more to science fiction than Star Trek. You really need to read your foundational authors. You really need to read your basics. You really need to read some Heinlein, Asimov. You need to read the, you know, the modern stuff. And that was fine. But after a while, that went from you really should to we're being inundated <laughs> to the point where the advice became, why don't you guys go to your own conventions? And guess what? That's what they did. Starting with the infamous, infamous, con the committee convention in New York. And that's where January 1972 comes from. And aside, again, from history that that was significant was that was the first, well, 20 years, we'd say that was the first media con media conventions, which were sci-fi in media, not just on the pages of a book or a comic. Media cons is basically now what we call our Comic-Con culture. And our Comic-Con culture came out of the fact that pure comic conventions, you know, mainly guys looking through dusty boxes of comics with artists on stage. When that went to Hollywood, everything magnifies once you're in front of a camera. Everything, even when you're writing a book, if it's a book about TV and film, the pictures will win out. And if you've heard the story of the first TNG companion, I've told you that story. But yeah, basically it's the kids got bigger than the parents. The first Star Trek con, and here's a, here's a look back, the Star Trek con, uh, first one, they planned for 500 people based on that flyer. They had a reporter in Variety do a story. And of course, Variety only at the time only had 20, 30,000 circulation, but it was both coasts. It was all over there. And then Variety stories got picked up. The New Jersey uh, newspaper did a story. They had 6 million. So from that 500, they wound up with 
3,000 and we stop counting. And then because after that happened, then you've got an annual thing. This is amazing. So 3,000 that first year planning for 500. You can imagine what that did for all the prepackaged, the programs and the packets and everything. It was crazy, much less the fire marshal. The next year they had 6,000. The next year, 15,000 and 6,000 turned away because it got to crisis stage and the fire marshal showed up midway through the main room crowd almost surged forward at the end of the main actor Q and a. And then the next year, that group, that committee, aside from springing up after four years, all kinds of copycats all over the country, which is fine, you know, Chicago and Houston and LA and also in New York and the commercial aspects seen in, seen to the visage of how Schuster, how Schuster, who was a, who was a dealer, had competing conventions and now we're off and running and now we're getting into turf wars and all that. But that last year they limited membership, the original committee's con in 70 limited to 8,000. So to go from planning for five, getting three, six, 15 with 6,000 documented turned away and then 8,000 limited at the same time. Now their formula for success is being copied all over the place and around the country. That's not only what set Star Trek fandom off and running on the public zeitgeist, but also, oh, look, somebody's making money at this thing. All that people power is out there. The locals, somebody started to put the dots together. Local reruns, these conventions are big, splashy shows. Hmm, 74, 75, what's going on in publishing world by then? Well, the Alan Dean Foster books are continuing, the novelizations of the original scripts in short story form, but also the animated series now. Did I say Alan Dean Foster? James Blish doing the original series. Alan Dean Foster doing the novels of the animated series, even doing, by the end, a full-blown novel length out of one 30-minute script, 22-minute script. And then, of course, the original Franz Joseph Schnabel Blueprints of the Enterprise and the Tech Manual ignited the book world on fire, showed the dollar potential and the numbers going on, and that got the wheels running and paramount was ahead of that dancing with gene on you know all the rebirth stuff happened but it all goes back to that first movie and that's just the star trek scope that's what helped george lucas get his funding for star wars boom now we're in the sci-fi boom things are off and running and eventually it lifts all boats of all genre entertainment and then we set the stage we light the match for what happened with twilight and comic-con san diego blowing up and that becoming <laughs> a thing on the on the radar. You roll it all the way back, all the way back. What busted what busted sci-fi fandom and its visibility out of the gate? It's this it's this January 1972 convention, the committee. Just as a fun thing, it's not on the flyer. The flyer, although I also want to say, do you notice the flyer says everybody welcome? Ah, oh, Star Trek fandom, you've been nice from the beginning. <laughs> Only Star Trek fans allowed. No, 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 no. Here's the deal. So at that first convention, the pre-reg price was $2.50. The door admission was $3.50, as long as they were even trying to bother with it. A table, a dealer's table or a huckster's table was $15. Now, I did a little inflation calculation. It's... So the pre-reg for this three days, now no actors, no actors. But if you if you um, had Star Trek Lives, the chapter where Joan Winston writes about who was on the committee, take uh, you know, visited, famously visited the last week of shooting on Turnabout Intruder, used her perch as an ABXZ executive in in uh, New York, who was a huge fan. Yeah, don't tell me there were no girl fans. Don't tell me that. She famously wrote a chapter about being on the Turnabout Intruder set the last week and then wrote another chapter in Star Trek Live. She was the guest author uh, with Marshak and Lichtenberg there, that first convention. Because of the success of that book, 70s wrote The Making of Star Trek Conventions, where she does a recap on the first year and then goes through these other years that we talk about. And she's kind of a primary source although there's plenty of other folks to uh, talk about. But it's fun to remember that that first year, Gene and Majel were late ads. But in 72, the guests were Isaac Asimov and Hal Clements. You know, they had New York-ish based sci-fi writers. Whether or not they'd written for Star Trek or not. Um, I'm trying to see here real quick. 
uh, Oscar Katz, who, remember Oscar, where are you? Who famously was the guy who hired Herb Solo, who was the young blood who got Star Trek and Mission sold to uh, NBC and CBS. Uh, then he went back uh, to um, to New York with CBS and came over and talked about the selling of Star Trek. Oscar Katz uh, did two years of convention appearances back in the day. Uh, the rest of the guest bill, Gene, I mentioned Gene and Majel. Uh, that was it. That was your star guest lineup in the first year. Now, Gene, Majel were back. All the rest including Leonard eventually, who was a surprise guest and came over from a play a couple of years later and shocked the world. Um, that was your viral moment before it could be viral. Everybody was there eventually, Shatner, Nimoy, you know, all the rest. Um, and some of the guest stars. That first year was no good. It showed the appeal of Star Trek, even without headliners to be there and these small prices, which even when Joan wrote her book <laughs> four years later, was laughing at how cheap the prices had been in 72. So it's, you know, the first con is is amazing for its, as a historical trivia question, yeah. But look what it unleashed, this budding power. It was a mature, you know, kind of a generation gap era youth movement, uh, baby boomer unleashed power in the 70s. But it also something else, the power of the imagination, the stodgy old limits and parameters of entertainment. There was a freshness and an excitement that was ready to bust loose. And also it's heralding a lot of the, you know, it was a time of social change. We'd already been through the first wave of the civil rights movement. Women's lib was very much in full flower. Uh, the eco movement, the green movement, the first Earth Day had just happened in 1970. All these movements in social, the old order was about to be upheavaled. And even though Star Trek was an old series, in fact, it's amazing to read that she has the fully Joan has the fully reprinted with permission story that had been in Variety. Uh, it's fun to watch them talk about Star Trek being an old series, being three years old, canceled. Also, the uh, the TV Guide story. Star Trek Conclave in New York looms as mix of campy set and sci-fi buff. This is by Frank Berman. No relation. How quickly they forget is not a statement that can be made about fans of NBC TV's old series Star Trek. The device of the sci-fi scan in 1969 brought some bitter attacks on the network, mostly from high school and college students. But it was off the schedule that fall, nonetheless. So far, there is an advanced registration of over 700, and 15 to 2,000 are expected to show up for the bash, which will run this weekend at the Statler Hill. Uh, talking about Joan Winston being Miss Winston, because it was New York media. Um, William Shatner won't be there, and he's apologizing for his TV movie, The People, running during Saturday primetime. It's, it's really a long thing. Calls it a camp meeting. Uh, the trading post concept, which was the dealer's room. Yep, yep, yep. I, it's just amazing. I mean, it's fun to go back and read those clips about the, I don't want to say the naivete, but the, the simpler, gentler times. And then to see how fast all that changed. And within two or three or four years, money and power and numbers begats infighting and turfing and copycatting and, you know, spreading. So it's a backhanded compliment. But again, it was what it was. It was not the first. It sounds like the interracial kiss debate, which isn't really a debate. It's just what do you, how are you going to define the parameters? Yeah, the thing in Newark a couple of years before at the library, 300 people skits. Uh, but this also marks the, the marriage NASA sent full scale lunar module displays that they had to assemble once it got there, which they hadn't planned on. They were thinking, you know, brochures and photos. It was, it was an amazing. It's one of those watershed moments. I've talked to some of the folks that were there. I've got interviews I should post. Uh, we should do more of this on the truck files to what we've already done. I urge you to go back and find the back catalog. But I'm just taking a moment right here. As much as we're all forward focused, a whole year of fresh track coming up. Amazing trailer for season two of Picard. People are so excited. Prodigy is just bubbling over with way more than people were expecting. Uh, of course, Discovery's got to wrap up its intriguing season. I'm thrilled to see so many of the creatives who work on the shows have grown up in the digital era and they're out there talking and sharing and we're out of the clam up stage of early Discovery years. That's exciting. But I can't believe 
no one mentioned the 50th. We're so anniversary crazy. I can't believe no one mentioned the 50th anniversary of uh, Star Trek Lives, the first Star Trek con, New York, that set not only Star Trek's revival and fandom back, but gave us gave us Comic-Con culture. Now, if you got a competing opinion, let me know. I'm not trying to... It's, that first convention is the crown of so much anyway. But I think in a larger picture, it really broke open the mold for what pop culture could do and be to uh, audiences of whatever age. They love to talk about those kids in the 70s. But you know what? Those kids are the old fogies now. And we've had two or three generations of kids since then. Uh, or we didn't. And that became worrying. And now, thanks to Prodigy and just this full buffet of Star Trek, I think we're going to get the kids back. This era's kids anyway. And we won't have to we won't have to grow them ourselves. And hey, with that Playmates announcement, just having action figures back Target and Walmart, um, and wherever you may get your toys. Uh, that's reassuring too. Very reassuring. So yeah, we can take a moment to look back, but also look around today. What? Everybody was asleep? The anniversary internet machine didn't latch onto that? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. So there we go. I've done my part. So if you're leaving us right now, I want to say, first off, did I bring anything up for you? Did I conjure up any thoughts there? Had you thought about the direct line between the first TrekCon and our Comic-Con crazy, we don't have to be in the closet anymore. Hey, there were 10, 20 years there of a lot of geek nerd closet dwellers. Not so much anymore. Now, now, the tourism and trade committees, the Chamber of Commerce, come after you if they hear you're putting on a con in their little burg. And they want you, they want to help you with the sales tax and the hotel motel tax that might bring into their little town. So yeah, things have changed just a tad since then. It's one thing to say the geeks won, but let's look at what that actually means. I want to thank all of our, our Patreons for the moment here. Uh, Diana Hopkins, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, and Marie Siegel, Keith Rombach, Justin Porteous, Nathaniel Robinson, and Belays K. And our live wires, Rusty Harrell, Halbjord Gunn Johnson, Jalen Bullock, Robert McLean, Alan Hoensey, J.R. Poole, Byron Bailey, Dave Gregory, and Casey Shafsky. Thanks so much, everybody. If you want to see what that's all about, um, check it out. This is the end of the month. They'll be collecting this Patreon, patreon.com slash Trekland Live. Just a five and a ten. You can go. We have some Patreons who have not been limited to $10 if you really feel like it. If you go much more than that, though, I just to say go ahead and jump into Portal with us every month. And we'll deep dive that way. But uh, thanks. Thanks to all of our Patreons who are doing that. We just had our fourth anniversary. If you're following me on any socials, uh, we throw up a little celebration plug. It's been four years ago, the 23rd. Uh, amazing. We've done seven seasons. About to start season eight. So thanks, everybody, for your support over there on Facebook. Make sure and like and subscribe on the page. Uh, thanks for everybody who dropped by Life Support Live with us every Saturday, 10 a.m. Saturdays. 1 p.m. Eastern, Dr. Ali and Dr. Trek. One of us is a real doctor, actually, going boldly through uncertain times. Um, check that out, too. And again, uh, saying socials, if you're following along, it's Larry Nimichek's Trekland. Facebook, YouTube, where you are right now. And Instagram, would love to have you there. Please subscribe on YouTube if you can. And Larry Nimichek on Twitter, portal47.net is our deepest dive of the year so far, the way we do it every month several times with the Portales. Uh, we've got guest night this week, and even they don't know that our guest this week is going to be the great, the great guru of promotion and documentary, the first 20, 30 years of Star Trek, Don Beck, who was a guest on the Trek Files two or three times in our limited little 15, 20-minute format. But now... <laughs> You have not lived until you've heard Don Beck alive. Well, alive, but live and unencumbered by time limits. Once he gets rolling with a story, uh, his stories and unfettered blunt opinions about the 80s and the 90s and the things you remember of being the be between the lines Star Trek promotion, distribution, early days of UPN, the early DVDs and videotapes. And even amazing stories about selling next generation in a world where that model didn't exist. 
uh, he had a front row seat for a lot of, lot of amazing years and just documenting Star Trek. The TV specials about Star Trek you saw, that's Don. Can't wait for that. And that's our Portal 47 guest this month. Thanks so much for everybody who's been with us today. Uh, if you're leaving us, as in you're watching this on YouTube later, what can I say, gang? Um, oh, no, no, I have one more thing to do. Before we say goodbye, yikes, I'm going to open up another unboxing. Here's another unheralded unboxing. And part of this is, well, if you were with us last week, you'll know. But I want to open up. I almost want to open this up as if it's for the first time. But I'm so excited. Uh, got a book you may have heard of. I've got it in this uh in this uh, bit here, we're going to get into it. Um, yes, I did that totally off camera, didn't I? Let's do this in the lap. Hey, have you heard about this? The Discovery Book of Grudge? Surely you know about Queen Grudge, the cat, Booker's uh, book's cat on um, Discovery. They've it, she's a feline waiting to have an empire. I'm so sad we weren't at this stage in the 90s. Spot deserved all this. Spot was actually Monster and Brandy. Uh, the active spot and passive spot. Uh, grudge, well, the persona of Grudge is amazing. So Rob Perlman, this is from here, our friends at Hero Collector. They don't just do little starships and magazines. They have a book line going. You've seen that. The, the white covers, Voyager's been done, the original series. Uh, different writers. Well, the book of grudge is from Hero Collector, but Rob Perlman is the author. He's done some a lot of the fun, the fun books, the <laughs> fun with Dick and Spock, uh, fun with Dick and Jane, uh, fun with Kirk and Spock, which is a takeoff on the old uh, Dick and Jane books. Uh, the Red Shirts Guide to Survival, all kinds of fun little books. This is not a little book. See, it's hardback, and I know we're past the holidays, but if you have. If you've got a friend who's a cat lover, if you've got a Star Trek friend who's a cat lover, this would be awesome. And you know what? It occurred to me, what better way to spread Star Trek marketing than to slip this into the cat lover's gift basket that you know who isn't a Star Trek fan? Because there's some really, there's a lot of great photography. Uh, somebody was on set doing, well, also cartoon. See? But it's, it's grudges, grudge the cat on. Uh, Starfleet, see, grudge on, uh, grudge on universal translators. There's some really clever, clever stuff here. Grudge on the data sphere. And I think in the back, there's even one here on, well, grudge on dogs and grudge on spot. I don't know her. <laughs> Ooh, spoilers, spoilers. Anyway, it's a great little book. Uh, it's not just jokes and pictures. It's really the persona of the queen. Rob's done another great job. It's a fun gift. You can find it anywhere. Of course, get it on Amazon. This is also great. Talk about expanding the base. This is great. Whether you're doing you know, brick and mortar shopping, it still exists. It's making a comeback. COVID be damned. It's still there. They're hanging in there. Or if you're looking at your you know, Amazon queue or Barnes and Noble online queue, wherever you're Wherever fine books are uh, sold online, having it in the queue, turning up with the algorithms is also a great way to spread Star Trek among the cat world. So uh, think about it. Do it. I enjoyed it. It's a ton of fun. Um, I'm a reformed cat person because I grew up as a dog person until we had our dear Schneider for about 13, 14 years, uh, who was my dog cat. Not quite a grudge, thank goodness. <laughs> But grudge is grudge, and no one can doubt that. So, everybody, uh, give a look. Get one for yourself. If you know a cat person, here's your chance. Here's your chance to evangelize Star Trek. Uh, sneak it in there. Be subversive. The Book of Grudge by Rob Perlman from Hero Collector. Uh, it's a lot of fun. All right, now we will say take a very micro quick break here and say thanks everybody hey uh, if we're leaving you now seriously stay healthy do all the things stay woke and by that i mean 
check out the sources of what you read. Check out the idea of that person screaming at you online. I want to do a topic in coming weeks about if we're really in a shift or not, what's going on, because fandom is such a bubble of the greater world outside. I'm really curious about this. But as always, be safe out there, but also be ready to take in information when you know it's legit. I guess what I'm saying, everybody, is, uh, yeah, truck well.